Today we are starting a brand new series called Good Again. It's a series that we have been talking about and preparing for for just a little bit because I think it's a series that whether you're a Christian or not, it's going to, you know, this is something that relates to all of us. We're going to be talking about a topic that I think all of us are experiencing and have experienced. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But first, I, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, so hang with me. But I want to start in a bit of an unusual way because I think all of you have something in common that you don't realize with this guy right here. <clears throat> Not the looks. Y'all are way better looking than that, in case you're wondering. Most of you. Scott, uh, anyway. So, mo most everybody. No, I'm, I'm talking about something different. Now, you, we don't know anything about camels. So I did a lot of deep research on camels, uh, which means I Googled them, okay? And here's the thing that's interesting about camels. Camels are known for their strength, their stamina, and their resilience. Now, that's what you have in common with them, right? Camels are known for their strength, stamina, and resilience. So, the thing that's so unique about camels is they can march across scorching deserts for thousands of miles carrying heavy loads, and they can go for weeks on end without drinking water. It really is pretty remarkable. Um, it's like they have endless endurance. The problem is their strength is also their Achilles heel. So this is what makes camels so unusual. They will march and march and march and work and work and work and go without water, you know, weeks on end and seem perfectly fine until they're not. They'll seem good until they're not because they give no indication that the reserves are emptying. And so the minute that they run out of water reserves, one second they're fine, the next second they just collapse and die. Now the reason I bring this up is because in a lot of ways, we've all experienced this. We know what it's like to go through life and everything be good, good, good until it's not because suddenly our reserves are empty. We just didn't realize it. And over the last three years, and we're not going to talk long about this part because all of us are ready to move on. None of us really want to talk about what happened the last three years. But over the last three years, we have been tested in a lot of different ways. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, our reserves have been emptied and we won't know it. And we'll be good until we're not good anymore. Not that you need a reminder of all the things that have tested us the last few years, but here are four big ones. We all remember the health pandemic, so we're dealing with, you know, isolation. We had to isolate from everybody else, so we, had, we were isolated, we were sick or trying not to get sick, and then in many cases we were scared, not just necessarily scared that we were going to die, but you remember, especially early on when we didn't know much, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm scared I'm going to give something, give it to my parents and kill them, or my grandparents and kill them, or my kids, you remember all of that? So we had all of that pressure and all that tension going on, and then there were all the economic challenges of the last three years which obviously started with the COVID shutdown, and then there were all the supply chain issues, and then none of us could get toilet paper. Y'all remember that? And there were toilet paper hoarders. We know who you are because you had to get storage units to hold off. You still have big stacks. Not that we're bitter at you, but anyway. So, so we had all of that mess going on, right? And then you come out of that with massive inflation, which leads to recession, whether they call it or not. I mean, we've been in a recession. I don't know if they've officially said that's what we've been in, but that's what we've been in. So you had all of that going on. There have been all these economic challenges. And, and then you had the social unrest component that came in the last three years. So tomorrow we're celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. Day. One of the things that's extraordinary about him, I don't know if you've read a lot about him, but one of the things that's extraordinary about MLK is he modeled and taught in such a phenomenal way how to have these difficult conversations around racism and racial injustice. But as y'all know, in the last three years, as all of this stuff has bubbled back to the surface, these were some much-needed conversations we had to have, but most of us were not equipped to have them. And so that created all kinds of pressure and tension, and in some cases, you know, created real messes for some people as they tried to navigate them and just didn't do a very good job. So you had all of that you were dealing with. What do you say? What do you not say? You know, what do you do there? And then... As if all that wasn't enough, then there was a political tension, right? So we've had two different election years that we've had to deal with, and the, the political tensions really haven't stopped the last three years. They've just continued to build and mount and go on and on. So you take any one of those four things, and it's a lot for anybody to handle. But then you put all four of them together, and that's just at a macro level, right? We're not even talking about the tragedies some of you have been through. Or the trauma some of you have been through in the last three years on a personal level. We're not talking about the health issues. We're not talking about the family stuff. We're, we're not talking about all that stuff that you personally have had to deal with. You, you put all of that together, and it'll empty your reserves pretty quickly. You put all that together, and it will wear you out. 
which is why in the last 12 months, I have heard over and over and over again, I've said it myself, I think we've all said or thought it at some point, the common, as we're trying to come out of this, the, the common theme for all of us is simply the idea we're ready for life to be good again. That's a phrase I hear. Just ready for life to be good again. It's like we gave up on normal. We don't even know what normal is anymore. I just want life to be good again, you know? That's what we all want. And the thing that it's been interesting to observe people, because the thing I think that most of us assume is getting in the way of life being good again is that we're, we're tired. We're tired. Physically, mentally, we're exhausted. And so as we're coming out of this you know, interesting three-year run, it's like, I'm just so tired. If I, if I could just fix being tired then I think life will be good again. And so it's been fascinating to watch as people have decided to try to fix this tired problem in a couple of different ways. And I don't know which of these groups you fall into if you fall into either one. But it seems like a, a majority or a percentage of people have said, the way I'm going to fix this tired problem is I'm going to isolate myself. And then there's another group that's like, no, 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 I just need to escape. So there's a group that have isolated themselves, and that's what I mean by that is simply, that's those of you who have decided, I am so tired, the best thing for me to do is not to re-engage socially, and it's not to reconnect relationally any more than I have to, which is why this whole work from home thing became so popular. It's like, I don't even want to go into the office anymore and I've got to. I just want to stay in my pajamas and do my work and not have to deal, I'll just deal with them over Zoom, you know? It's like, I don't want to have to deal with them. So you got, you got the group of people, and maybe this is some of you who are just like, I'm going to be hands off. I'm going to withdraw a little bit. I'm going to isolate. And I totally understand that because we're living in an interesting time with the cancel culture and everything. If, if y'all notice, it's like conversations are much harder to have with people, even friends now, than they were back in 2019 because it feels like everybody's angry about something. But you don't know what they're angry about. So if you're having a conversation with somebody, you're just trying not to step on that landmine. You don't know where it is. But if you bring up that topic or say something, that they disagree with, it's like everybody just blows up now. Next thing you know, you can ruin a relationship really quick. It can get heated really fast. And so for some of you, I get this. You've just said, I'm going to isolate. I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to play it safe. So I'll just stay at home as much as I can. I'll binge watch Netflix. I'll shop online. I'll scroll social media. I'll find something to do with my time. But I'll rest up right here at home. And if I spend enough time away from everybody, then life will be good again. That's one approach people have taken. The other approach people have taken is, no, 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 I'm going to escape. In other words, I'm going to make up for all the stuff I've missed out on during 2020 and 2021. And so they actually have coined a term for this I thought was pretty funny. I like this. They call it revenge travel. Revenge travel. So it's like, okay, I had trips in 2020 plan. They got canceled. Then 2021, they got canceled. So now, and I'm going to take all, you know, the last three years worth of trips, I'm taking them all at once, you know. And we are traveling, some of us are traveling more than we have ever traveled before. We're traveling all the time. This is all about, I, I'm going to fix being tired because I'm going to get away on some adventures. I'm going to get away, uh, you know, to some destinations. I'm going to get away on some vacations. Or I'm going to get back involved in activities I couldn't do then, so I'm going to do them now. And I'm even going to do more of them. And so some of us were traveling more than we've ever, ever traveled before. And that's certainly true around here. And this is not a, this is not a criticism or knock, but we know that's happening here. Uh, for instance, from last spring to last fall, we had about a 50-person drop in terms of we track average number of volunteers who were serving every Sunday. So there were on average 50 vo less volunteers serving every Sunday in the fall than the spring, and it wasn't because they quit. It's because you were all traveling. You were all gone, and you were not gone like, I'm going to miss a Sunday, and I'll be back. It was like, hey, I'm going to miss the next five weeks. I'll see you at Thanksgiving. That's kind of how it was, you know, because you had all of this going on. Nothing wrong with that, okay? Nothing wrong with that. But here's what maybe you hadn't paused to think about. I think we're doing whichever way we're taking, isolation or, you know, escape, isolation or destinations. It doesn't matter. I, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to fix this I'm tired problem. And so no matter which road you have taken or approach you have taken, here's my question for you. How has it worked? I don't know if you've ever stopped yet to think about this, but how is it working? How is it working? Has it actually fixed your problem? Or, and this is what I hear and see some, you went on that trip and it was amazing. Everything was good while you were there. It felt like things were good again. But then you came back and things weren't good anymore. And so you decided, oh, 
maybe I wasn't gone long enough or maybe it wasn't the right trip, so let me try this and let me extend it and go a little longer. And you keep trying. The problem is when you come back, it's, just, it's like it snaps right back into where you were before. Or you spend as much time as you can away from everybody, but it doesn't seem to actually fix it. And the reason I think that may be true is because we're actually trying to solve the wrong problem, so we're using the wrong solutions. I think the thing standing between us and life being good again is not that we're physically and mentally tired, although that could be true, but I think it's something deeper. I think it's that we're empty. And what I mean by empty is we're empty emotionally, we're empty spiritually, our reserves are empty, which is to be expected after everything we went through over the last three years, both nationally and then, you know, add on all your personal stuff. It's to be expected. But your inner life, your inner reserves are empty. Your soul, this is how Jesus would describe it, your soul is empty. And no amount of isolation and no amount of destinations will actually fill an empty soul. You've got to take a different approach. So what I want to do throughout this series is I want to talk about this issue and maybe help us to see if this is an issue for us that we hadn't even realized it. And then more specifically, I want us to get really practical. And so for the you know, next three Sundays of this series, I want to give you three very practical keys to consider on how to fix this problem so that life can become good again. But first today, I just want to show you an invitation that Jesus makes because he has something very specific to say about this. And here's the thing I want to warn you about. Depending on what kind of church you grew up in or what kind of Christians you grew up around or the, the version of Jesus that's been presented to you, you may have a hard time believing that Jesus can actually address and wants to address fixing an empty soul in the sense of making your life good again. Because the version you may have had presented to you or seen is, oh my gosh, if you try to follow Jesus that way, it wears you out. If you try to follow Jesus that way, it, it sucks everything out of life. But that's actually not the reality of what Jesus came to do, nor is it the invitation that he extended to us. I'll show you what I mean. He was talking to his followers one day, and he looked at them and he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and all of you who are burdened. It's like, how do he know? You know, this has been a problem forever. But he's not talking about physical or mental exhaustion. He's talking about this soul level, this emotional, this spiritual emptiness, weariness, burden that we all experience from time to time. And some of us experience it because we're carrying all the burdens of the past. You're weary, you're exhausted because you're carrying shame, you're carrying guilt from the past, you're carrying tragedy, you're carrying trauma, you're carrying hurt, you're carrying pain from the past. You're, you're carrying things that nobody should ever have to go through or nobody should ever have to experience, but you're carrying it. You're carrying conflicts and relational rifts, you know, all that stuff. For some of you, you're weary and burdened because you're carrying a lot of stuff from your past. Some of you, you're weary and burdened because of the present pressure you feel, and you feel it deeply. It may be a financial pressure. It may be a relational pressure, a pressure in your marriage, a pressure if you're a parent with parenting kids, pressure at work, but you're feeling this pressure. And, and some of us, we're weary and burdened because of the fears of the future. It's, oh my gosh, I'm so uncertain, and I'm so anxious, and... You know, it's just, it's so frustrating. And I'm so tired of, this is how you say, I'm so tired of, you know. Uh, I'm so tired of the conflict. I'm so tired of the uncertainty. I'm so tired of the anxiety. I'm so tired of the depression. I'm so tired of working too much. I'm so tired of running so hard. I'm so tired, I'm so tired. You're just weary and burdened. And it's overwhelming. And part of the reason it's overwhelming, part of the reason that this gets all of us is because we all want to get life right, don't we? I don't, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. We all want to get life right. We want to get our finances right. We want to get marriage right or dating right or parenting right or, you know, career right or school right, whatever it is. We all want to get life right. And so it gets pretty overwhelming when you're carrying all this stuff. You feel all this pressure. You're afraid of what's going to come in the future. You're trying to get it all right. You're not sure you're going to get it right. And then to make matters worse, we end up being overcommitted because we think we've got to say yes to everything in order to make sure we get everything right. So you're saying yes to every opportunity that comes your way because 
well, if I say no to that, I may miss out on something at work and then my career doesn't end up where I want to end up. And I'm going to say yes to this because if I say no to it, it may hurt me relationally or at school or whatever. And then if you're a parent, I mean, good grief. Not only are you saying yes to everything because you want to get parenting right, but then if you're a parent, it's like I got to say yes to everything because the worst thing in the world would be for all the other kids to do something that your kid didn't do and then that somehow hurt them down the road and they, you know, can't get into college or, you know, end up not having a productive career or whatever your thing is, right? So, so we're wanting to get everything right, and we're not sure how to do it, so we're saying yes to everything so we don't miss out on anything, which overwhelms us even more. And then, as if we need anything else to make it difficult, we are, and you can't really argue this, we are the most overexposed generation in the history of the world. And all I mean by that is this. There's never been a time before us when people knew as much about what was going on in the world and around the world as we do now. I mean, everybody's connected now, so you know everything, right? Which means you see and I see all of these people who seem to be getting everything right, and we fall for assuming that they really have it right when their lives are really a mess behind the scenes. You know how this works, but they only post the stuff that looks good. But it feels like they've got it right, and we feel this pressure to create an image where it looks like we've got it right. And so you put all of that together, and no wonder, no wonder, you're weary and you're burdened. And Jesus says, all right, if that's you, if that's you, I have some good news for you. If you will just come to me with all of that, if you'll just give me all those burdens, if you'll just give me all that weariness, if you just give me all that baggage you're carrying, he says, I promise that I will give you rest. But not like, go take a nap, rest, you know? More than that. I'm going to fill your soul. I'm going to fill your reserves. I will give you a solution to the emptiness that you're wrestling through, that you're struggling with because of everything that you're dealing with. To which we all go, well, how are you going to do that? And Jesus gives an answer that makes no sense in our context. Here's what he says. He says, just take my yoke upon you and learn from me. From gentle and humble in heart, you will find, here it is, you will find rest for your souls. Problem is, none of us use a yoke anymore, right? You may know that's a farming instrument, but let me give you the context for this. In a first century Jewish world, when a rabbi talked about a yoke, what they meant was their way of life. So every rabbi, people, they would all get these followers. And the reason you would choose to follow a rabbi is because that rabbi was teaching a particular way to approach life or a particular way to shoulder the weight of life. And if that resonated with you and you thought it would work better than what you're doing, you might follow that rabbi and they would say, they've just taken upon themselves the yoke of that rabbi. So this is Jesus' way of saying, there is a way of life that I have that I want to invite you into. If you will just adopt, embrace, imitate my way of life, you're going to find rest for your souls. That's where my way of life leads to which again some of us given what we've been exposed to go no no no, I don't think it leads there I've watched those you know Christians and they don't seem like they're happy people at all you know they're not at rest at all they seem like they're worn out all the time and Jesus goes well they're not actually following my way of life and he kind of doubles down on this he says for my yoke well it's easy my burden it's light and you may have never thought of following Jesus that way. This may have not been your experience of what it's like to follow Jesus. And this is not criticism. This is your fault at all. But if following Jesus has not felt like this, you're probably doing it wrong. You're probably doing it wrong. Now, just to clarify, Jesus is not saying that an easy life is an option. It's not an option. I mean, we live in a broken world. And until Jesus puts all that back together and makes everything new, life's going to be hard. It's always going to be hard. An easy life is not an option, but according to Jesus, an easy way of life, well, that is an option for all of us. And he says, I want to invite you into it. So I want to invite you to consider this. You have some way that you are trying to make or keep life good again for you. But is it working? And I want to suggest, you can disagree with this, but maybe you just spend a little bit of time thinking about it. I want to suggest that life will never actually be good again until Jesus' way of life becomes the rhythm of your life and the rhythm of my life. Because if tired was our only problem, we'd just all go home, take Sunday afternoon nap, we'd be fine tomorrow. 
go take a nice vacation for a week or two and we'd come back and everything would be good. But maybe our problem is deeper than I'm just physically and mentally tired. Maybe, and this is no fault to anybody. I mean, good grief. Think about everything we've been through in the last three years. Maybe on the other side of this, our reserves are empty. Our soul is empty. And you can't fix empty with a nap. You can't fix empty with a destination. You can't fix empty with some isolation, some extra time at home. You can only fix empty with a different rhythm of life. And Jesus says, I want to invite you just to take my way of life and sync your rhythm of life up to it. And I promise you, if you'll do that, you'll find rest for your souls. Which, whenever I was younger and I heard preachers talk about this, I was like, that is the most unhelpful thing ever because what in the heck does that mean? You know, it's like, uh, it's not practical, and I'm about to, you know, kind of add to that frustration because if you looked at Jesus and said, well, what do I need to do then? He, he, he never gave anybody a list of 10 things. It's kind of what we want. Just give me a list of 10 things, I'll check it off. No, no. He would look back at people and he would just give them a two-word invitation. He would say, follow me. Well, yeah, but what am I supposed to do? Just follow me. Now, in the first century, this was literal, though. He was like, literally, follow me. Why don't you just come hang out with me? And the reason he was saying that is because his invitation was, why don't you just hang out with me and watch my way of life for a little while? Watch how I make decisions. Watch how I navigate through pain. Watch how I handle relational conflict. Watch how I go through some of the challenges and difficulties I face in life. And then how about you just sync up your rhythm of life with my way of life? How about you just imitate what I do? And you'll find rest for your souls. This wasn't a promise of, oh, I'm going to smooth things out so life's good. It was a promise of, no, I'm going to show you how to navigate through all the difficulties of life that come to all of us. So, I was tempted to end the message right there. But again, all of us would leave and be like, I don't know what to do with that. So, let me be a little more practical, okay? Here's the part you can grab hold of. We're going to spend the next few weeks talking about what this looks like in a practical sense. But I want to give you three goals to consider. If you're like, I would like to at least explore what it means for the rhythm of my life to sync up with Jesus' way of life, there are three things you got to do. First of all, you got to be with Jesus. Secondly, you got to become like Jesus. And third, you got to do what Jesus would do if he were you. Hang with me. These are all sequential, and you can't do one without the other. They build on each other, okay? First of all, I want to encourage you To be with Jesus, and all I mean by that is, what if you spent a little bit of time with Jesus getting to know him better and getting to understand what his way of life looked like? We can't physically do that like people in the first century. But you can do that by opening up the accounts of Jesus' life and reading them. And for some of you, you've got this rhythm already in your life where you spend a little bit of time reading scripture every day and praying and kind of figuring this out and learning who Jesus is and, you know, what what he values and all those things. But if you have never done this, I want to make it really simple for you. You can go to our app, and like I said, if you don't have our app, scan that QR code in the seat in front of you, and you can grab our app. And on the homepage of our app, we have two different recommended reading plans for you as we go through this series. And I intentionally, because if you hadn't done this, this is not an easy habit to develop. So I intentionally pick some where, like, you can read in five minutes and you're done. Okay, that's it, five minutes. And you don't, I pick some where you don't have to read seven days a week because, you know, no pressure to be perfect. So if you could just develop a habit maybe during this series or try spending four or five days a week just reading a little bit through our reading plans, what it'll do is this. It will help you begin to understand what Jesus' way of life might have looked like. Now let me tell you what happens the more time you spend understanding who Jesus is. Then you're able... And it honestly, it naturally happens in some cases. You start to achieve the second goal, which is become like Jesus in character. Become like Jesus in your way of life. Become like Jesus in terms of you start thinking the way Jesus would think. You start valuing what he would value. You know how this works because the longer you're around somebody, the more you become like them, right? For those of us who are married, we get this. You know, you're married long enough, you finish each other's sentences, and you know how each other would make decisions. And, you know, I, I I just know if I drive by Starbucks... If I don't hang a left and turn in there, my wife's going to hit me in the arm. I just know that's how that works, right? 
doesn't even have to tell me anymore. So the, the longer you're with Jesus, the more you're going to start to understand what he cares about and do it. So you can't do that until you're with him. But if you just start, you know, read and plan, over time you become a little bit more like Jesus, which then allows you to do this third thing, which is do what Jesus would do if he were you. Now, just to make sure I'm clear, this isn't like, well, what would Jesus do? And you look at what Jesus did in the first century in the accounts of his life, and you go, I guess I should do that. No, no, no. First century world and our world today is two totally different things. This is coming to a point where you would understand, okay, what would Jesus do if he were me in 2023? And once you know him well enough and you've begun to understand what he values and think like him well enough to know that, then it becomes much easier for your rhythm of life to sync with his way of life. It becomes much easier if we're talking practically for you to have a rhythm of life that allows you to experience peace. Life can't be good again unless you have peace, right? You got peace with God. You got peace with others. You got to be at peace with yourself. We'll talk more about that next week. For you to have a rhythm of life where you wake up every day and you feel like you have purpose, that there's meaning to it, beyond just, you know, this is about me and what I'm doing, that there's a bigger purpose and meaning behind it, that you're part of something significant, bigger than you. And for you to have a rhythm of life that syncs up with Jesus' pace of life, a pace of life that's sustainable, a pace of life that's healthy, a pace of life where you're not drained all the time, where it's not like your battery's always on empty and where people never get the best of you and where you, you know, you're trying to bend but not break. You, we all know this. You can be like that for a little while, but eventually you break, don't you? So Jesus is going, no, no, no. Aren't you just to be with me? Learn to think like me. Learn to value what I value. And then learn how to do what I would do if I was literally in your shoes in 2023. Because life as far as I'm concerned, life will never be good again for you or for me if all we do is try to fix the physical and the mental aspects of our exhaustion. No, no. You got to acknowledge the fact that maybe, maybe like the camel, you've been marching across the desert for a long time and everything's looked good and you've carried the load. You have been extraordinary. Your strength, your stamina, your resilience as you've faced all these challenges has been incredible. But you just might be setting yourself up for failure. You just might be good until suddenly you're not and your reserves are empty and your soul is depleted. So this year, I want to help you develop the kind of rhythm in life that keeps your soul filled, where spiritually and emotionally you're as good and healthy as you are physically and mentally. Because life can't be good again. Until Jesus' way of life, he promises this way of life will give you rest for your souls until that way of life becomes the rhythm of your life and the rhythm of mine. So this week, simple. You want to take a step in that direction? Open up our app, grab a reading plan, try four or five days this week, spend five minutes reading. But you're reading for a purpose. You're reading to try to better understand and see what Jesus' way of life was like. And if it interests you, then this series is for you. And we'll pick it up right there next Sunday. Let me pray for us. Father, here's the thing. If, if we're honest, a lot of us would like for our rhythm of life to be different. If we're honest, um, as much as we hate to admit it, we would have to admit that maybe our inner life is empty because of everything we're dealing with and going through and have gone through. At the same time, we don't really want change because change is so hard. But if we just keep doing what everybody else is doing, we'll get what everybody else has. And if we keep doing what we're doing, we're just going to get what we've been getting. So would you give us the wisdom to, to see if our challenges are more than just we're tired, if our challenges might have to do with our soul, and then would you give us the courage to begin to change so that we're not good until we're not, so that we don't just keep marching and trying to hold it all together, but then suddenly it all falls apart and we and all the people we love the most are impacted by it. Help us to discover this way of life that is uh, that's marked by peace and by purpose and by a pace that's healthy for us. 
Help us to figure out what that looks like and uh, this year to learn how to sync up your way of life with the rhythm of our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen.